Israel continues to bombard Gaza with fresh airstrikes. Conservative parties sweep to power in New Zealand poll. Good afternoon and Salah Melissa Madani. I'm Otto Othman and you're watching World Today. Israel pummeled northern Gaza with fresh airstrikes on Saturday as it forced Palestinians to flee the area before an unexpected ground offensive against Hamas commanders. Troops fired at the densely populated enclave, sending huge plumes of black smoke into the sky. There's no let up as night fell, the explosions lighting up the darkness all around. Localized raids have also taken place as Israeli troops encircle the Gaza Strip. In Gaza, health officials said more than 2,200 people had been killed. According to the United Nations, more than 1,300 buildings in Gaza have been destroyed, while local hospitals and the exhausted staff have become overwhelmed with growing numbers of dead and injured. With food, water, fuel and medical supplies running low because of an Israeli blockade, aid agencies are warning of an impending humanitarian crisis. On the diplomatic front, Saudi Arabia pressed for an immediate ceasefire, while the United States called on China to use its regional influence to push for calm. Lebanon's Iran-backed Hezbollah group said one of its fighters in South Lebanon was killed on Saturday by Israeli fire as cross-border tensions rise over Israel's war with Hezbollah's Palestinian ally Hamas. A Hezbollah statement said the fighter was martyred in Israeli strikes on in clashes. Mayor Mohammad Saab said two Lebanese civilians were also killed in the Israeli shelling of the southern village of Sheba. Earlier Saturday, Hezbollah and Israel said they had exchanged cross-border fire. Hezbollah said it had fired guided missiles and mortar rounds at Israeli positions in the disputed Sheba Farms section of the border with Israel and the annexed Golan Heights. Israel has traded fire with Hezbollah and allied Palestinian factions in Lebanon on a nearly daily basis since Sunday, although the tit-for-tat attacks have remained limited. Lebanon's army said on Saturday that Israel was behind cross-border fire that killed a Reuters journalist and wounded six others near the border the previous day. United States Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met in Riyadh with Prince Faisal bin Farhan on the latest stop on a six-nation tour of the region. Saudi Arabia has spun suspended talks on potentially normalizing ties with Israel as the war raged between Israel and Hamas. The Saudi Foreign Ministry called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and its surroundings and the urgent delivery of humanitarian aid. According to Saudi Arabian Foreign Ministry, the current priority now is to stop civilian suffering, which is a stance clearly adopted by the Arab League. It agreed to find a way to quickly de-escalate the situation, bring back peace, stopping the guns, and then working towards addressing also the humanitarian challenges. The Gulf Kingdom, home to Islam's holiest sites, has never recognized Israel and did not join the 2020 U.S. brokered Abraham Accords that saw its Gulf neighbors Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Morocco, establish formal ties with Israel. U.S. President Joe Biden's administration had been pushing hard in recent months for Saudi Arabia to take the same step. New Zealanders resoundingly elected a new Conservative government Saturday, with incumbent Prime Minister Chris Hipkins conceding his centre-left Labour Party's six years in power were over. Hipkins, who replaced Chris' charismatic two-term leader Jacinda Ardern in January, said he was not in a position to form a government and had already congratulated Prime Premier in waiting Christopher Luxon. The National Party and its Coalition Partner Act were projected to win 61 seats, with 97% of the vote tallied, enough to secure a majority in New Zealand's 120-seat parliament. The former airline executive said New Zealanders had, quote-unquote, reached for hope and voted for change. 
The election campaign had been dominated by an increasingly difficult economic situation and a spike in the cost of living that has hit New Zealanders hard. Luxon pledged that the National Party will deliver for every New Zealander, promising to build the economy and deliver tax relief. The 53-year-old, who claims to sleep only five hours a night, completed a rapid political ascent as only four years ago he was working in the private sector. While it's MMP and the numbers are likely to move around... Ecuador's armed forces prepare electoral material for delivery on voting day to the country's prisons in the Quito district of Cumbaya, a day before Ecuadorians will cast their vote for a new president. Shell-shocked by the eruption of a bloody drug war that was spilled from the country's prisons into the streets, Ecuadorans will vote for a new president Sunday, just weeks after a popular candidate was assassinated in public. A climate of fear hangs over the campaign in which the two finalists, socialist Luisa Gonzalez and Banana Empire heir Daniel Noboa, have both vowed to address the escalating violence. A state of emergency was declared after Villa Vicencio's assassination, and Noboa and Gonzalez both campaigned in bulletproof vests surrounded by heavy security details. Whoever wins will be elected to only 16 months in office, completing the term of incumbent Guillermo Lasso, who called a snap vote to avoid possible impeachment for alleged embezzlement. The main concerns of Ecuadorans, according to recent polls, are crime and insecurity, followed by unemployment. Australians rejected giving indigenous people constitutional recognition and greater rights in a landmark referendum on Saturday. Deputy Prime Minister Richard Marles said Australians have not voted for a change to the constitution as partial results pointed to a resounding defeat for the reform. The results scuppers plans to amend the country's 122-year-old constitution so that it can acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders for the first time. Those opposed to the reforms led those in favour 60% to 40%, with all but one of the six states that needed to also be in favour actually voting to reject the proposal. The highest number of yes votes were registered in Victoria with 46%, with Queensland seeing the lowest at 32%. The indigenous citizens in Australia make up about 3.8% of the country's population of 26 million and have inhabited the land for some 65,000 years. However, they are not mentioned in the constitution and are believed to be some of the most economically disadvantaged people in the country. Two people died after being swept away in floodwaters in central Vietnam on Saturday. A 61-year-old man and a 13-year-old boy drowned in the floods and around 5,000 people were evacuated from homes in Da Nang on Friday night and Saturday morning. Vietnam's Disaster Management Authority said almost 500 houses were inundated with water in recent days. The coastal city of Da Nang has been hit with heavy rain, as have areas from Ha Tin to Quan Nam provinces since Tuesday. In Hu City, roads were flooded by the Perfume River, with water reaching nearly chest-high levels in some areas. Last weekend, three people died in flash floods and landslides in northern Vietnam. Heavy rain is forecast to continue across the middle of the Southeast Asian nation in coming days. Vietnam is frequently slashed with harsh weather in the rainy season between June and November. According to the country's General Statistics Office, natural disasters including floods and landslides have claimed around 100 lives in the country since the beginning of the year. Scientists have warned extreme weather events globally are becoming more intense and frequent due to climate change. Up next in sports, it's an all Malaysian final in Finland Open. Stay tuned.
Starting off our sports segment this afternoon with badminton news. It will be an all Malaysian affair in the final of the singles event at the 2023 Arctic Open Badminton Tournament in Vanta, Finland, as Li Zijia and Ng Ziyong both got through the semifinals. In the action at the Vanta Energy Arena, it was Zi Yong who first booked a spot in the final when he easily beat the seventh seed from Japan, Kanta Tsuneyama, 21-12, 21-16. Zi Yong started off brightly and dominated the first set and carried the momentum to the second set to verify his ticket into the final. Meanwhile, national ace shuttler Li Zijia, who is desperately looking to end his title drought, proved to be too much for Danish shuttler Ander Attenson to handle. Using fast-paced gameplay, Zijia managed to secure the first set in his favor with 21-17. Into the second set, as tension mounted high between the two shuttlers, Attenson had to withdraw from the match after experiencing leg injuries, paving the way for Zijia to meet with compatriot Zi Yong in the final. This will be their second meeting since Australia Open last April, where Zijia won the clash with 17-21, 26-24, In doubles category, Man Wei Chong, T Kai Wun also booked their berth in the final after putting down Danish duo Rasmus Pierre, Frederick Sogard. The national duo, however, had to work hard in the rubber set before they can stamp the ticket into the final stage with 19-21, 21-13, 21-19. In the mixed section, Chen Tangji, To Yi Wei failed to qualify for the final after bowed down to fourth seed pair from China, Xiang Zhenbang, Wei Yasin, 21-17, 13-21, 14-21. In tennis, Robert Hukac ended Sebastian Koda's run at the Shanghai Masters, advancing to the final with a 6-3, 6-4 win on Saturday. The pole seeded 16th, won 85% of the points on his first serve, aided by 14 aces in the 77-minute semifinal match. Both players were efficient, with Hukac posting 27 winners and 5 unforced errors to 22 and 4, respectively, for Korda seeded 26. Hukac hit 14 aces and dominated on serve, and one break of Korda's serve in each set was enough for him to reach the final. Korda caused an upset when defeating second seed Daniel Medvedev on his way to the semi-final, but was unable to deal with Hukac's pace and precision. Hukac didn't face any break points in the match, but broke the American in two of four chances, which proved the difference at the ATP Masters 1000 event. In the final, Hukac will be seeking his seventh ATP Tour title against Andrei Rublev, the fifth seed, who ousted 18th seeded Grigor Dimitrov of Bulgaria 7-6-6-3 in Saturday's other semi-final. By defeating his good friend, the Russian now has won all 10 sets in Shanghai. In MotoGP, Pramac Racing's Jorge Martin won his fourth straight sprint with a spectacular showing at the Indonesia Grand Prix in Mandalika on Saturday to roar to the top of the championship standings after Ducati's Francesco Bagnaia ended in eighth. Martin, who started on the second row in sixth place, held off a late charge by pole sitter Luca Marini, with Marini's VR46 racing teammate Marco Bezzecchi coming in third. The Spaniard turned on the aggression as soon as he shot off the mark, moving into fourth place before systematically and ruthlessly barreling past Fabio Quartararo of Yamaha, Luca Marini and Maverick Vinales of Aprilia into first. Martin is now top of the rider's standings for the first time in his career with 328 points, with Bananya 321 in second and Bezeki 272 in third. VR46 Racing also had cause to celebrate, with their two riders putting in heroic performances to claim podium finishes despite having both suffered collarbone injuries in recent weeks. 
World champion Banyaya, who started in 13th after failing to qualify from Q1, finished in 8th place behind teammate Ania Bastianini. There was some consolation for Ducati, however, as they retained the Constructors' Championship. Honda's six times MotoGP world champion Marc Marquez, who confirmed earlier this week that he will be joining Gracini Racing for the 2024 season, crashed out in the first lap. Aprilia's Alexi Espargaro also crashed out early in the race, also taking out Brad Binder through the Red Bull KTM rider, was able to get back on his bike and end the race in 19th. Now moving on to rugby, New Zealand put in a brim defensive performance to prevail 28-24 over Ireland in their World Cup quarter final in Paris on Saturday, setting up a meeting with Argentina for a place in the final. Now the All Blacks played for 20 minutes with 14 men against six nations champions and had to dig deep to defend their try line through 40 phases in the dying seconds at the top ranked Irish searched for a winning try. New Zealand led 13-0 after penalties from Richie Maunga and Jordi Barrett. Added before in the 19th minute, Lester Fainga Anuku went over in the corner after Bowden Barrett had gathered his own up and under. Ireland cut the deficit with a sexton penalty before finally breaching the New Zealand line in the 27th minute, when centre Bundy Aki's blend of footwork and power took him through three tackles. The All Blacks responded when R.D. Savea dived over by the flag to take the lead out to 18-10. New Zealand scrum half Aaron Smith was yellow carded for a deliberate knock-on almost immediately. However, and his opposite number Jameson Gibson Park darted over for a converted try to make it a one-point game at the break. The All Blacks kept their line intact until Smith returned before Maunga sized through the Irish midfield in the 53rd minute, racing clear before sending winger Will Jordan in for his 28th try in his 29th test. Referee Wayne Barnes awarded a penalty try when the Irish mall collapsed, sending hooker Cody Taylor to the sin bin in further punishment for the All Blacks, who now led by just one point. Jordi Barrett added another penalty in the 69th minute to extend the All Blacks' lead to four points and set up a thrilling but scoreless last 10 minutes. Qatar's Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani has informed the Glazer family that controls the Manchester United PLC that he will not improve on his bid to acquire the iconic soccer club for more than six billion US dollars. The move leaves the remaining bidder for the Manchester United INEOS chairman Jim Ratcliffe in a stronger position to cut a deal. He has offered to buy only a 25% stake in the club, allowing some of the Glazers to cash out, and it remains unclear whether he will clinch an agreement. Jasim, who had also promised to invest more than $1.7 billion in Manchester United after he acquired it, still wants a deal but has informed the Glazer family that there is no point in remaining in the bidding process following nine months of unsuccessful negotiations. Jasim would not have used any debt to acquire Manchester United and his bid would have paid down the club's existing debt pile. Representatives for Jasim declined to comment, while Manchester United did not immediately respond to a request for comment. A historic journey of Mickey Mouse, a mind full of twisted gothic fantasy and wholesome move by gaming giant, all that in today's offbeat lineup. From Mickey Mouse sketches to Cinderella's glass slipper, a new exhibition opened in London on Friday celebrates 100 years of the magical world of Disney. The Walt Disney Archives has selected an array of art, props and costumes featured in classic animations such as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and The Jungle Book, as well as more recent live action productions like Cruella and Beauty and the Beast.
More than 250 items are on display at Disney 100, the exhibition, which begins with an introduction to animator and producer Walt Disney and his character, Oswald, the lucky rabbit, said to be the prototype for Mickey Mouse. Throughout the exhibition's 10 galleries, visitors can look at props including the carousel horse used by Dick Van Dyke in Mary Poppins, two production models of characters Lumiere and Cogsworth from the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, we at the Walt Disney Archives are the keepers and the caretakers of Disney history, and so we were given the task of creating this special exhibit for the 100th. And I think what's interesting about this exhibit, there's a lot to look at, there's a lot of really fun interactivity and projections and media and things like that, but there are also some very, very special artifacts and things from our collection. And um, a lot of it, deep storytelling in this exhibit. You can, you can come in and just see the fun things that are in cases and enjoy the photo opportunities, but there's also interactives there. You can take a really deep dive into Disney history. Also featured are sketches and interactive stations and items from Marvel, Pixar and the Star Wars films now part of the Disney conglomerate. The exhibition at London's Excel, of which another version will open in Chicago next month, runs as the Walt Disney Company marks 100 years since its founding, considered to be when Walt and his brother, Roy Disney, signed a contract with the New York cartoon distributor, Margaret Winkler, on October 16, 1923. The public can now explore the heart and mind of Oscar-nominated director Tim Burton, who is famously known for films like Edward Scissorhands, Frankenweenie, and Corpse Bride, in an exhibition of his drawings and models at the National Museum of Cinema in Turin, Italy. The world of Tim Burton, which has been seen in countries around the world, took shape in New York in 2009 at the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA. So when I first saw it, it did feel like, you know, it seemed like your laundry hanging on the wall or something. So you feel, like, I felt quite exposed, you know. But I feel that way anyway with films. And I, I don't know why I do them, because I, it's like, I like making them, but then they, I get sort of terrified of showing them, but whatever. It took a couple of years for curators to compile all the drawings and sketches from Burton's personal archive, some of recognizable characters, others that have never been seen on screen. When he first drew the character Jack Skellington from 1993's The Nightmare Before Christmas, Burton said he had no idea what he was drawing or what for, and that drawing, quote-unquote, brought out his subconscious. And I kept drawing it and drawing it, and I looked to see like hundreds of versions of it. And I got like, so it, it kind of brought out the subconscious, it brought out those feelings where I think, oh, I'm going to draw a drawing about this. I just let the drawings come, and it's, for me, it was much more emotionally telling and something that w w there was an idea that I would get out of the stuff that was more important than an intellectualization of it, if that makes sense. Burton's current movie projects include a sequel to his hit film, Beetlejuice, which he said was just days from being completed when the writers and actors went on strike in Hollywood. He also talked of his fondness for his lead character in Netflix TV series Wednesday and hopes that the pause button might be slightly off and production back on now that the writers have reached a resolution. Burton's latest exhibition opens on October 11th and is due to run until 7th April 2024. With large buttons arranged in a circle and a joystick on one side, Sony is launching a PlayStation controller designed to make gaming easier for people with disabilities. The new device can be placed on a table or fixed to a stand and oriented in any direction. Each button can change shape thanks to magnetic caps, making them easier to press or grab, and the user can assign any function to them. When we started in 2018, uh, we found in some cases players would do 
heroic things to try to play with the standard controller, even if it was not the most comfortable. Um, and it would greatly limit the amount of time they could spend playing because it was so you know, difficult and uncomfortable, basically. And we hope that with the access controller, it opens up a window now to being able to play longer and more comfortably, which they simply couldn't do before. Jeremy Lesser, a.k.a. Gizmo, a professional gamer who suffers from myopathy, is impressed with the controller, adding that he would not be surprised if a normal person will also use it. According to Lesser, the new controller is, quote-unquote, extremely well thought out because the company has tried to make it accessible to people with a range of disabilities. According to a 2021 report by UK Disability Equality Charity Scope, two-thirds of disabled gamers face barriers to playing games, and 40% have bought video games that they were unable to use because of poor accessibility. Melanie Ellert, a German game player suffering from spinal muscular atrophy and can only play with her right hand, said it was too soon to compare PlayStation's new controller with its competitor, launched five years ago by Microsoft for Xbox. But the development of these kinds of devices is essential for her. I was playing as, as a child and then I couldn't play for about 15 years. So I, um, yeah, I waited very long to be able to play again. We hope it will change the conversation around game design. Now, if you're a game developer and you have this connect, you, you have the knowledge that a player might be using an access controller, it might, you might ask yourself, oh, are there accessible features we might want to offer in the game, for example. So we hope we could also drive for changes in actual game software and game design, knowing that such a controller now exists. The controller will be available from 6 December at a recommended retail price in Europe of 89.99 euros and 89.99 dollars in the US around the cost of existing classic. Transparent and concise. Paparan komprehensif, ringkas dan padat. Saksikan Kanta 744, 744 malam. Berita perdana 8 malam. Malaysia tonight, 8.30pm. Well, that marks the end of World Today. A reminder of our top story, Israel continues bombardments on Gaza with fresh airstrikes as it grounds troops, prepares for invasion. Now do join us again tonight at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Saloran Brita RTM for more news. I'm Otto Othman. Thank you for watching. Malaysia Madani, Dekat Perpaduan, Penuhi Harapan.